Starting off is always tough. So, I've got to think of something. Who of you is single? It's estimated there are around 20.5 million singles in the German language areas of Europe. The internet and romance fit together wonderfully. The positive thing is that you get out of your own bubble and meet people you wouldn't meet otherwise. The chances of clicking with someone have increased. If you wait for happiness to fall into your lap, you can wait forever. Any place, any time, quick and simple. For initial contact, a digital wink is enough. The choice seems infinite. Today, more than 2,500 platforms are available for searching for the perfect match. And the delete button is a big help in weeding out the non-starters. People looking for a mate are spoilt for choice these days. There's a platform for every need. Quick sex, secret affairs, or a lifelong bond can be sought online. Many people are active on several platforms, like 37-year-old Sarah. She lives in Vienna and has been single now for six years. Many apps enable the first selection to be made from a photograph, while GPS indicates who lives in the vicinity. If you like what you see, you swipe to the right. If it's a no-go, you swipe left. If both parties are interested, it's a match, and the chat gates open. I'm actually looking for a steady relationship, starting with the desire for someone who really wants to open up and spend time with me, who wants us to open up to each other and do things together, and then see where it goes from there. More and more people are using online dating services. The figure for Germany is 9.6%. And Austria brings up the rear with 6.3%. <laughs> In addition to smartphone apps, where a choice is made on the basis of a photo, there are also match brokers. Clients fill out a questionnaire. A computer program then works out who might be a suitable partner. Cool calculations lay the foundation for love. Now and then, I find profiles where I think, wow, I just have to get to know him. I've got this feeling, simply from the photos and five written statements. But that very, very rarely happens. Still, in reality, it's often confirmed when we first meet. I've got a feeling I can guess pretty well. I know what I like about a man, and I sense quickly if it's there. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean things will necessarily end positively. You're not dating enough. Believe me, everyone is just overjoyed when I send them on a date. Because dating is worse than brushing your teeth. Dating is like learning vocabulary. Everybody wants to speak a foreign language, but nobody wants to sit down and do their homework. We ask Sarah to take advice from one of the countless dating coaches who flood the market. Known as the Date Doctor. Emmanuel Albert gives flirting and dating tips on TV and social media channels. He charges two to five euros a minute. In other words, between 120 and 300 euros an hour. Going up to someone and speaking to them is just as important as online dating. Even more important. When you're dating with Tinder, you swipe back and forth. Maybe you like this woman, maybe she'll respond, maybe not. So I always say, speak to people. The people who come to me are a real mix. A few more men than women. The breakdown is around 60% men to 40% women. But things are very similar when it comes to the ability to build a relationship. That's a big issue today. People no longer commit so easily. It's a lot harder to find a relationship. 
In this respect, the tips I give are very similar. But when it comes to speaking to someone, getting to know someone new, men need a lot more courage to take that first step. You have to give them support to take a more direct approach and be present. The self-styled Date Doctor provides digital and analog advice in the search for a partner. Every man, he says, can be a ladies' man. Don't be shy. Just practice, practice and practice some more. The roles are clear. The man is the predator. The woman the prey. We can fudge it a bit. Take the famous three. Three kilos, three centimeters, three years. That's still just fine. We need classic answers to classically stupid questions like, so what are you doing here? How long have you lived here? Because we don't want to say, I've been here 10 years and know 2,000 guys. And wow, I saw you and thought, we might hit it off. When I think about how men stretch the truth, it's mostly about how tall they are. I'm a fairly small person, so in my case they didn't need to. Sometimes they lie about their age, too. Or they try to pose as someone who's looking for a serious relationship. But then they don't follow through, and it ends fast. Women cheat too, me included. It's because of my age. In my experience, the older a woman is, the less attractive she is, just because of the number that's showing. My pictures are all real and up to date. I know that I look younger than my age, so I'm not embarrassed to say I'm younger than I really am. I make myself about four years younger, max. And I do tell them that when we first meet. Just imagine, you speak to five men every week. Could it be that one was nice, and you had two or three good chats with someone you never see again, but with whom you had a good time, someone that has things in common with you, a buddy for whom you might not have feelings of love at all? People underestimate what can happen when you speak to someone every week. You're setting a foundation and then building on it. Where online dating is concerned, he does have certain pointers to give. I'd give them to any of my girlfriends, anyone. Personally, I find them all rather obvious. But if someone is just starting off with online dating and feels they need advice, certainly they can talk to him. I do think that for other people it makes sense. Today, choosing the right partner is a crucial cost-benefit calculation. Just like choosing the right job or apartment. Dating calls for self-optimization and promotion. It takes time and effort. When I say I'm dating someone, then it really means work. I want to open up to that person and do lots of things with them. Many use the word dating to describe always meeting someone new. And in that case, I'd say, the work is more superficial. And you need to make sure that you've got lots of time. Myra Weigel is a historian at Hartford University. She's researching the cultural history of dating. Her work describes the search for a partner from the start of the 20th century until today. We caught up with her in Ferrara in Italy, where she and her husband were invited to speak at an international conference. When I was researching the book, I would talk a lot to people, and when people learned I was writing a book about the history of dating, they would tell me about their own dating lives, and often I would notice uh, this language of exhaustion, you know, this language of feeling exasperated. What I mean by that in my book is that Dating, which is sold as a kind of consumer activity or fun, uh, is related to what we think of as real work in at least two ways. 
First, it absolutely in, is a kind of economic transaction and always has been. On dating apps, we should be desirable commodities and surpass the competition. It also requires people to work on themselves. And I don't know how well these idioms translate, but in English, all these expressions we have for courtship are market expressions. So you're on the market, off the market. Damaged goods is not nice, but a thing people say, hard to get. So this idea that you're trying to shape yourself as a kind of commodity that you're selling on the dating market, and you're simultaneously shopping around uh, for someone else, this is something new in the historical period I'm talking about, and it's something that makes people feel a lot of pressure to work on themselves endlessly. In the upmarket Munich neighborhood of Schwabing, we are meeting psychoanalyst Wolfgang Schmidbauer, Germany's most famous couples therapist. His work has given him first-hand experience of the challenges and problems involved in the digital search for a partner. Es ist ja viel leichter Getting to know people, new potential partners, is a lot easier for those who have the courage to get involved on the digital dating scene. At the same time, it's also scarier. In the final analysis, it creates a totally new, previously unknown situation. You're unable to orient yourself in the unimaginable number of possible relationships. This was much more restricted earlier and wasn't stimulated to the point that a person was unable to say, now I finally found someone and I'm glad about it. Instead, they're wondering, is it okay to stop now? After all, there could be a better offer. And because everyone involved is searching for someone, everyone's wondering if there could be something better out there, which promotes a feeling of chronic insecurity. You become extremely indifferent, a lot more superficial than you really are. And I probably have too, I've become a more superficial person. It only takes one photograph in the mix to make you think, mm, maybe he's not the right person. Then you immediately swipe to the left, which of course means he's gone. Heike Meltzer is a sex and couples therapist. Recently, she began to answer questions about sex on dating apps. She believes digitization has changed the way we get to know one another and our sexuality. She warns of an over-sexualized society. Today we live in a kind of paradise. A table has been set before us and we have an amazing range of choice, around the clock and usually free of charge. Our next partner for a lovely evening can be quickly found on our smartphone or GPS, perhaps already at the next bus stop or in the same train. These days, the first topic to be discussed is sex. People don't see if they can actually speak to each other. You know someone's sexual preference before you know their name. Sometimes you don't even know that. You're in an anonymous sphere full of available opportunities. We're being released, given infinite freedom, and we first have to learn how to handle it. A partner stopped being a requirement for sex a long time ago. Sex toys are growing in sophistication and allow increasingly intense experiences. Heike Meltzer warns of casual use of what she calls tools for super stimuli. I've observed three major changes in my practice. First, old sexual problems are coming in a totally new form. Young men with erectile dysfunction and men and women who can't achieve orgasm or a lack of enthusiasm for sex that was said to be exclusive to women. But in the spirit of equality, men are now catching up slowly and overtaking women. Lack of lust isn't their problem. Lack of a desire for sex with a partner is. There are qualitative changes too. What used to be hardcore is now soft porn. 
Things like voyeurism, fetishism, exhibitionism and BDSM, formerly seen as perversions, have arrived in regular society. They are no longer seen as abnormal behavior. And then there are the quantitative issues. The gap is steadily widening between virgins who cater to themselves wonderfully in virtual worlds, who know everything theoretically but have no practical experience, and those who tinder from bed to bed. Here is where we slip very quickly into porno and sex addiction. This applies to the virgins as well as the promiscuous, who can no longer find the off switch, or who are unable to be intimate in a proper relationship. It's true for both, even those who tinder from bed to bed and who actually try to run away as soon as the knickers drop. People, I think, are just as faithful or unfaithful as they've always been. But the opportunities for infidelity have increased considerably, while economic pressure on people to remain faithful has dropped enormously. In the past, there'd be a letter or someone would be caught in the act, or a hotel bill for a double room in that suit jacket that went to the cleaners. The result was a jealous outburst and a heated argument, and the affair would be downplayed or there would be a confession. But the chasm that opens after checking someone's mobile phone, reading their emails, and seeing all the photos, all the facets of a relationship laid bare in the form of images and texts, well, that's a shock, especially when a partner had no clue. And this, I feel, has become a totally new kind of relationship problem. The people who met online used to lie and say, we met at the farmer's market. <laughs> if they said we'd met online, they may as well have said we got to know each other backstage at a sex show. <laughs> Or by answering an ad in a hardcore magazine. <laughs> it would have had the same effect. Before about 1800, if you had told anyone anywhere in the world that what marriage is, is that you choose your favorite person and live just with them and any children you have for the rest of your life and that you should be together because it's your favorite person and your best friend you also want to have sex with, people would have said you were crazy. That concept is less than 200 years old. Before then, passion often took place outside the rigid confines of a conventional marriage. Nevertheless, we all have this centuries-old ideal in our heads. Romantic love as the basis for marital bliss. Back then, parents had a large say in the search for the right person. The big shift to greater personal freedom went hand in hand with massive social upheaval. That it's around the time of the Industrial Revolution, around the time that men start working for wages, that people start working in industrial jobs outside the home, all these massive social changes that take place around the time of the French and American Revolution, uh, we start to see these new family forms and this new ideal of romantic love, right? That people should choose their partner. But freedom of choice applied to men only. Women had to work hard to advance by marrying a man from better circles. Then began the self-improvement culture. Once it ceases to be that men come to the woman's home, invited by her and supervised by her parents, and becomes the case that men invite women out, right? Men invite women to go to a bar or a dance hall or a movie. The courtship starts to take place in a men's world, in the world of the market, in the world of work. The story of dating is also one of emancipation. The first women to agree to go on dates were workers and immigrants who had come to the cities. After the First World War, the wealthy began to date as well. It was all the rage. The moment that I call the invention of dating, we also see the rise of many new kinds of social spaces where young people can mix and meet one another. These include dance halls, these include movie theaters, these include boardwalks where you might go out. 
I talk about these as a kind of analog or real life social media because like our social media today, they're sites that bring people together and facilitate certain kinds of interactions. So a bar that you go into is set up for you to meet and interact with people in a specific way, in a way that's not totally dissimilar to the social media we rely on so much for dating today. Online dating is a booming economic sector. Turnover in 2018 was estimated at 3.4 billion euros. Whitney Wolf is one of the founders of Tinder. Now the best known dating platform worldwide, its clients choose partners on the basis of photos and GPS. Wolf has turned her back on Tinder and now runs her own bright yellow empire. Another dating app called Bumble. Wolf is often referred to as the dating queen because, as they like to say, she revolutionized online dating. We didn't really think about it as a, revol a revolution on dating. I think it was really giving people access to people in ways they'd never had access to each other before. So if you think about it, traditionally you rely on being at the right place at the right time or having a friend introduce you to someone and so you have very limited options in who you meet. You don't have access to see who's in the building next door and have the opportunity to meet them if you want to. This just never has existed. That's not quite true. In 2009, Grindr, a dating app for gays, became the first system to locate people nearby. It was already on the market three years ahead of Tinder and the rest. Grindr is still a step ahead today. It's cooperating with the dating community to fight racism and discrimination by using humor to make users aware of marginalizing profile texts. That contrasts sharply with many heterosexual dating apps, where users are made to feel that such social pressures don't exist. I think the best thing you can do on online dating is use it as a platform to truly be yourself. So in real life, there's a lot of pressure to maybe fit in with your colleagues or your friends or to fit a certain mold and to try to be something. Every dating app needs something that makes it unique to lure clients who want to date, especially women, to the platform. At Bumble, the marketing pitch is centered on feminism, and the first step of making the match is for women only. Whitney Wolf carefully maintains her image as a powerful woman. Yet on her social media homepages, she celebrates herself with a tongue-in-cheek profile of herself as a luxury housewife. While she permits the world to share in her jet-set lifestyle, of course she also ponders how technology could be used to make the world a better place. So, technology just gives people a platform to behave in another format, right? But they're still being people and they're still, you know, reacting to their psychological triggers. And if you think about the way we've raised men and women globally, men have constantly been given the, um, the pressure to go after women, to chase them, to get them. And when there's this pressure to go get something, you're going to be rejected, oftentimes. And if you think about the psychology of rejection, it's very powerful. Rejection leads to obsession and aggression. And so when you reject somebody, and that person has the ability to hide behind a profile, and there's no government to control the consequence of bad behavior, you are left with a lot of abusive behavior. Tinder had ja damit geworben, dass man <coughs> Tinder promoted itself by claiming it had done away with the pain of rejection, because you don't even notice when you've been deleted. But of course that's not the case. The pain simply comes later. If someone has got their hopes up, then they're likely to get hurt even more deeply. Because they found they've been discarded when the other person has found something better. This form of rejection is known as ghosting. Simply disappearing happened in the past too, 
But in an age of digital communication, contacts are just as easy to end abruptly as they were to establish. Many fear that digitized courting is ushering in an end to romance. People claimed that the telephone ruined romance. The dial-up phone, the one that our grandmothers and grandfathers used. People also claimed that the car ruined romance because back in that time, the, the, the parents would be involved when they're, they're, when they're kids at an age of marriage, whatever that means now, um, started dating, that they would be there, they would accompany them, they would be involved, and the car could take you away. So this is just technology, and this is innovation, and this is, this is um, us innovating as cultures. It's not destroying it, it's giving more access. The car changed lives that lets you get from point A to point B and lets you explore your love life and your relationships so much better. The telephone, of course, life-changing. And these platforms to connect with people are also life-changing. What we have seen is, with online dating too, that the relationship is romanticized artificially. I was just about to cancel my Parship subscription, so to speak, when I found you. And then I lost interest in everything else. That, I think, still represents deep yearning. I was using Parship and did the psychological test. For 20 minutes you have to answer questions like do you like raisins or did you often wet the bed as a child? In the end you are one of three kinds of people. I'm only 10% intellectual and only 10% emotional. But 80% of me is passion driven. So I don't think powership is so great. I like flattering psychological test results better. What is more, powership costs 60 euros a month. Or is it cheaper for straight people? This is Hamburg. There's just one red house on the street. This is where Hugo Schmaler lives. Now 88 years old, in the 1960s, the psychologist developed the first matchmaking test for a magazine and later the notorious Parship test as well. 80 questions and a top secret algorithm are designed to help someone find their better half. Also, ich bin uh, so uh, überheblich. I'm arrogant enough to say that my characterization of a person is fairly accurate. If it's slightly off, that could be because he or she didn't give honest answers, or maybe answered in a way that they thought would be more acceptable, or give them an attractive characteristic that they don't really have. Of course, self-perception and the way others see us can diverge greatly. But that's a problem across the board, not just one that's exclusive to Parship. People can have a totally skewed self-image. The high-priced for payment platform is one of the leaders in the German language dating world. The firm attaches importance to being beyond comparison with Tinder and other online services. Parship says its core and unique selling point is the ultra-serious scientific matching test, which includes questions like, do you sleep with the window open? Long-term relationships generated from zeros and ones. But what about romance? Professor Schmaler has a tip. Internet and romantic passt wunderbar. The internet and romance go wonderfully together. Put two candles next to the computer and you've got romance, even when you're searching or filling in a questionnaire. Romance is wonderful, but it's in here. And you can also get manufactured romance on the internet. Today, every toothbrush is ordered online and arrives in the mail. So we've gotten used to the idea of finding a partner this way. Why not at home? We do everything with these electronic busy boxes. 
Maria Klein, too, has been in the love business for more than 40 years. It is, yeah. Okay. Good. Then would I say, fang Sie doch mal an, ja. Das mal an. To begin with, there were matchmakers and dating agencies. Then the dating sites shot onto the market. And I'll put it this way, we had a bit of a famine. Sometimes I really wondered when I would just close up shop, when I would no longer be able to live from it. But over the course of time, that changed again suddenly. It's bounced back. I wouldn't say people are leaving the dating platforms, but they're coming back to me more often. The good old dating agency is a relic from the pre-computer age. Stocked with file cards, neatly sorted according to name, income, profession, and naturally, social status and family background. Klein also selects possible partners by hand, which of course increases the cost to the client. After all, here, the wheat is separated from the chaff in advance. My fee is 3,000 euros for younger clients, rising to six, seven, or 8,000, depending on the degree of difficulty. That might sound a bit strange, but if someone is rather special, then the search for a suitable partner is more complicated. Everyone who comes to me can make suggestions based on my existing clientele. But when I notice that something is going a bit more special, then I go in search of the right partner. Maria Klein says that she's made more than 1,000 matches. She's been in business now for nearly 40 years. In old-school style, she places ads in upper-middle-class newspapers and still uses this tried-and-true method, just as she did in the past. Appearance is always important. That's just the way it is. I always state quite clearly that a person rarely falls in love with good character. Since it's about a relationship, sex appeal is part of it, and that means finding the other person sexually attractive. This is an important aspect, and it's important as well that the two people are similar, have the same sense of humor and outlook on life, so they'll be able to understand each other when they converse. According to a study by a Chinese dating platform, for at least 5% of men, there is never a lid that fits. They end up on the digital back burner. Even though for many years now, countless guides have been published about the art of wooing and the alleged secrets you have to know in order to find your dream mate. The roles which men and women have to play in this pas de deux remained unchanged. The woman is the passive object of desire, and the man, the hunter. There's a book for men called The Game and a book for women called The Rules. <laughs> uh, and I think that this difference, you know, The Game is a book all about how to make women feel desperate to sleep with you and sort of how to get disposable, fast relationships. The Rules are all about how women must never show what they want but play this long game of tricking men into liking them by, you know, not calling when you want to, not sleeping with them when you want to, making yourself seem inaccessible. And I think that the difference between the rules and the game really sort of distills the ways in which these very old-fashioned binary gender norms still play out in dating advice literature. Traditional gender stereotypes are what it's all about here. One, and two, and three, four, six. Thomas Schaefer Elmire runs this dancing school, which has been in business for a century. It's the Tinder of back in the day. And in Vienna, it's still traditional for youngsters to attend a dance course when they turn 16. You get to know so many different people. A dance course is a great opportunity to find someone who is on the same wavelength. That's why dance schools in particular produce lifelong and deep friendships, not to mention numerous matches and even marriages. 
One of the key things about a dancing school, especially in our modern era, is that the two genders can meet naturally and honestly on neutral ground and learn to get along with one another without having to have any fear of touching, literally. After all, when they start the course, they're unable to take up the correct dancing position anyway. They all come with this built-in personal space. During the course, they get over this, learn to approach each other, and move in harmony together. These are things which are also very important in life. Along with the Vienna Waltz, good manners are part of the course curriculum. These are the golden rules of etiquette for men and women most of which date back to imperial times. Old film material on how, or perhaps how not, to kiss a lady's hand. Some men take the lady's hand, bow over it, and the kiss is quite damp, making a lip-smacking sound that's not recommended. And some ladies pass up their good fortune when their hand is taken for a kiss, she doesn't want it and pushes her hand down hard. Now, there are two types of men. Those that give in and bend down to kiss the lady's hand, and the other, more energetic type, who says, she doesn't want one? Well, then I'll use force and add my other hand and bring her hand up, and there, the kiss, and the woman falls towards the man. From a kiss on the hand to smartphones, because these days, even a smartphone is a constant companion at balls in Vienna. It's a development the strict dance school director views with mistrust. We focus so much on our mobile phones and all these other things, but not on the people who are right next to us. And that's a major problem. My profile is just a one-liner. It says, on the first date, I pay for all the drinks. I think he can be expected to pay for things on the first date. That's worked so well that I send a disclaimer with my first text response. No cocktails. <laughs> Just beer and wine. No friends either. And I need to be allowed to sit at the same table. <laughs> They always say you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. So when I go somewhere, I have to think carefully about the kind of impression I'd like to make. I've got a list of icebreaker questions. Like, do you look pretty or ugly when you're crying? Once the conversation has gotten going, you should try to identify the other person's interests. They advise using the funnel method, start with open issues and then slowly focus on a topic that interests the other person. Or, what did your mum call your penis? Because when someone is talking about their favorite subject, they'll feel at ease and open up. That way, of course, you get to know someone much better than if you present yourself as a special deal yourself. Josef grew up in Kitzbühel in Tyrol, but has lived in Vienna for many years. He's already had one or two personal experiences with dating apps and says they provide perfect material for comedy. This thema dating is for Comedy. The dating issue is brilliant for comedy because we live in a time when there are more and more single households. An age when people work a lot and go straight home afterwards. So online dating is a way of getting to know a great deal about a person fairly quickly. Basically, online dating is also embarrassing. Because within a short period of time, you're showing someone part of yourself. And 
and everything that's somehow embarrassing has great potential to be something funny. The fact is that the internet has replaced the gay club, the workplace, and the church as the places where a couple first meet. Today, it's possible to find like-minded people worldwide. However, this advantage augments social inequality. According to a study, more and more couples have the same level of education. And one factor is universal. To find someone, you have to work hard. Know what you want, keep refining your search, and present yourself perfectly. While how we work is becoming more flexible, how we love is becoming more flexible too. The ways we live are changing. People are living much longer, for instance. They're living much more precariously as well. I think many young people, you know, don't know where they're going to work in five years, uh, don't know where they're going to live. We don't have the same kinds of long-term arrangements in many aspects of our social life as we used to. So I think that maybe what we're seeing uh, with this shift to more flexible definitions of relationships, people, deciding that they want non-monogamous arrangements. This is actually a reflection of a profound change in our social structures that's taking place. It's not just personal preference, and then you get the digital tool that lets you do it. It's like a real deep change. This is flüchtig. This fleeting, hectic characteristic, with everything taking place faster and faster, is of course symptomatic of society as a whole. So it's reflected in relationships, too. What's needed is a kind of opposition or a sort of barrier in that we close ranks against the consumer society that will allow a couple to find peace together. Sarah is on her way to a Tinder date in a cafe in downtown Vienna. We want to know what made her swipe to the right. What appealed to me was that he immediately mentioned that he's not interested in one-night stands because he wants to get to know a woman as a person. We've waited discreetly outside the cafe to find out how Sarah's date went. There wasn't a mega wow feeling. I think we'll probably have another drink. And then, depending on how late it is or how tired we are, I could easily imagine that we'll perhaps go have a drink somewhere else. But that's all. We'll both be sleeping in our own beds. 